The first mainstream movie to talk about AIDS is maybe still the best. Philadelphia still makes me cry, and the message of the film still resonates today. Let's take a look. I was 13 when Philadelphia came out, too young to really get it. At the time, I'd heard that gays are gross and HIV is scary, but I really did not know much more than that. But I remember, around the time of this film, suddenly people started talking much more openly about HIV. Even to kids. Magic Johnson joins Linda Ellerby on Nick's special edition, A Conversation with Magic. I'll be talking with kids about life and what it's like living with the HIV virus. So what changed? Why were we suddenly more comfortable talking about it? I think this movie played a major role. It's kind of genius that they cast Tom Hanks, the every guy next door that we loved in Sleepless in Seattle and Turner and Hooch and Joe vs. the Volcano. We love him. Even if he's playing the gay guy, gross, with HIV, scary, it's okay. And then the chemistry that he has with Denzel Washington is perfect. Even if you're grossed out by gay movies and uncomfortable talking about AIDS, which in 1993 describes a lot of Americans, you might be okay going to this film. The premise is that Andy, a successful young lawyer, is fired when his co-workers realize he has AIDS. What's that in your forehead, pal? Well, where? Andy wants to sue the firm, but no lawyer will take his case. Even ambulance chaser Joe Miller turns him down. I have a case. If you don't want it for personal reasons. Thank you, that's correct, I don't. Joe's feelings about Andy, and in fact, all gays, are clear. Those guys pumping up together trying to be macho and faggot at the same time, you know, I can't stand that shit. He's not alone. In 1993, only about 15% of Americans felt that same-sex relationships were not morally wrong. That's according to the National Opinion Research Center. But then, Joe starts to see something important in what Andy's doing. A higher purpose. Here's one of the first moments of the film that evokes goosebumps, when Andy's trying to convince Joe that there's been an injustice committed, one that cannot stand. This is the essence of discrimination. Formulating opinions about others not based on their individual merits, but rather on their membership in a group with assumed characteristics. By the way, one year earlier, Denzel Washington played Malcolm X, so his roles have had a more than passing acquaintance with discrimination. Joe still doesn't like gays. He's still guilty of what he just described, the essence of discrimination. Hey, so these people make me sick, Phil. But a law's been broken. You remember the law, don't you? But there's an important principle happening with Joe. You don't have to like someone in order to respect their rights. That's a lesson that some people still haven't learned today, ignoring laws to trample people they don't approve of. But Joe's belief that all men are created equal, words that were written in Philadelphia, is greater than his distaste. And then something starts to change. In the course of representing Andy, Joe begins to see him not just as a principal, but as a person. That bond grows slowly over a series of scenes that range from funny to goosebumps to I was crying uncontrollably. There's the time that they're dancing with their respective partners at a costume party, and suddenly, for a moment, you just can't remember what's so different about them. And then there's the opera scene. Andy puts on an aria for Joe. It's Maria Callas singing about how her home and family were destroyed during the French Revolution, and she was driven to ruin and despair. Brace yourself, because this scene completely broke me. I bring sorrow to those who love me. Okay, Andy's feeling the pain that his illness has brought to the people he loves. Ow. I am life. Heaven is in your eyes. In this part, she's singing about hearing a divine voice in the midst of her suffering. It's the embodiment of life that speaks to her, personified and given a voice, and it tells her, you're not alone, you're alive. Don't be afraid, because I, life, will sustain you even in your darkest hour. I am the God that comes down from the heavens to the earth and makes of the earth a heaven. Maria Callas is singing about the voice that keeps her alive. Andy's listening to her and hearing that voice too. Joe's watching Andy and he sees that gay men like Andy aren't what he once thought. They're fellow human beings. He sees a man lusting to go on living, and the scales fall from Joe's eyes. And tears fall from mine because I identify completely with Andy. And when I look into Joe's face in this scene, I'm seeing the moment when someone who always thought that he hated me realizes that he doesn't. Whew. Later in the movie, Andy explains what it is that drives him. I love the law. What do you love about the law, Andrew? Is that every now and again, not often, but occasionally, you get to be a part of justice being 
done. I love this line, because it sums Andy up, and it sums up why Joe took the case despite his initial resistance when he saw that Andy had been denied the equal protection of the law. Remember those words that convinced him? This is the essence of discrimination. Formulating opinions about others not based on their individual merits, but rather on their membership in a group with assumed characteristics. By the end of this film, Joe isn't just defending Andy in court. He comes to the hospital and literally gives him the breath that keeps him alive. Joe has become the voice in the opera that sustains the dying. And if he can undergo that change, anybody could. Thanks for watching, and thanks to Sardonic Ally and Davion Gilliam for suggesting Philadelphia. If there's a movie you'd like me to talk about, you can tweet at me, at Matt Baum, or leave a note in the comments. Subscribe here for more videos, and check out my podcast, The Sewers of Paris, for revealing stories about the entertainment that changed the lives of gay men. Now, if you'll excuse me... Oh, it's just my type.